All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How is everyone? Alhamdulillah. For the believer, it's always goodness, right? Yeah. Always goodness in all situations. And that is kind of uh, the premise of tonight, right? Why, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala test us? Um, it's important to understand this principle because all of us go through difficulty, right? Right? How many of you in here have never been through any difficult time in your life? Raise your hand. If you've never been through any difficulty. All right, I was going to say, you're not, you're not, you haven't been alive long enough. You haven't left anywhere, gone anywhere. We all have gone through difficulty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran very famously in Surah Al-Ankabut, uh, do you think that you'll be left alone upon saying believe and you'll not be tested? Do you think that you're going to say, Amanu, I believe, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to test you? Allah says, indeed, I am going to test you as I tested those who came before you. Why? So that I can see which of you are truthful in, 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 in their speech, which one of you are liars. Meaning that when we say that we believe, that belief is going to be put to some test. When we say that we are believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and we're following in the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the deen of al-Islam, we are going to be tested. Now, we see that Allah says, I tested you in this verse, like I tested those who came before you. So, let's look at the, some of those who came before us from amongst the Anbiya, and see that Allah tested them. Let's start with the first of us, Adam alayhi salam. Was he tested? Yes. Him and his wife were tested in the garden, right? Look at their test. And the test, as life has gotten more complex, the tests have gotten more complex. With Adam alayhi salam and his wife, they were given one test, right? What was it? Don't eat from the tree. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them, put them in the garden, gave them everything that they could wish. You know, all of this is for you. The only thing, there's one rule, one rule, right? Don't touch this tree. What did they do? <laughs> they broke the one rule. They did the one thing Allah asked them not to do. So they were tested. They were tested. But one of the things that we learn through this test, and there are many things that we have to learn through our tests. This is what we're going to talk about towards the end. Why does Allah test us? But one of the most beautiful things that I learned from the test of Adam and Eve in the garden is that that was needed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understood the course of human uh, um, genealogy and how we would be and what we would become. Therefore, with the first of us, He needed to teach us about the nature of our relationship with Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that nature of our relationship with Him is a nature of relationship number one with the ibadah, that we worship Allah, but also with sins and repentance. That would be the core of our relationship. Like, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He created us, illa liya'budun, but to worship Him. But do we do that perpetually? No. None of us are even capable of doing that perpetually. But one thing that I know that we are capable of doing perpetually almost is, Kullu bani Adam khata. Every son of Adam sins. That is something that is, it is similar to every single human being, is that we commit mistakes. We, we, we do what Allah has told us not to do. But the best of those who sin are those who repent. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put Adam and Eve in the garden and told them not to eat from that tree, he knew good and well what? They were going to do it. He knew they were going to do it anyway. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala, if you read his tafsir of these verses in Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the creative creation of Adam and him being placed in the garden, being told not to eat from the tree and doing it anyway, there is a conversation that he records in a narration where Adam alayhi salam asked Allah, My Lord, did you not create me with your own two hands? And Allah says, Yes, I did. He said, Did you not breathe into me the breath of life and cause me to live? He said, Yes, I did. Did I not when I sneezed? Because we know the first thing that Adam did when he was alive, he sneezed. And Allah said, Ya Allah, may Allah have mercy upon you. That's why we say it to one another. Allah said, Yes, I did say that. He said, Then he asked a very wise question, mashaAllah. He said, Did not when you told me not to eat from that tree, didn't you know I was going to do it anyway? Didn't you know we were going to do it anyway? He said, yeah, I know you're going to do it anyway. He said, then you cannot, can you not forgive me for that which you know I was going to do? And he said, yes. And he taught them to say, the very famous, my Lord, I have wronged my own soul. If you do not forgive me and have mercy upon me, surely I'll be from amongst the losers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew 
that they were going to do what he told them not to do. And he knew that all of the children of Adam السلام, every son of Adam that came after him was going to do the same thing. Therefore, he knew that he needed to teach us from the very beginning that the relationship between us and him will be one based upon repentance. Based upon repentance. That is the, 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 the core of, of the difference between our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and almost every other human being on the planet earth is that we understand our nature and the need of the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. That's all that matters on the day of judgment. That is all that will matter. It will not matter how much money you had, how much wealth you had, how many degrees you had. It, none of this matters on the day of judgment. It won't even matter how many salah you prayed, how much zakah you gave, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it from you and on the day you meet him, he says, for the stuff you did not do and for the stuff I told you not to do and you did it anyway, I forgive you. That's the only, that's it. That's all that matters. The scholars have termed forgiveness as thammanul jannah, the price of paradise. This is the key that enters you into the door of Jannah, is being forgiven. And the only people who will have an access to that key are the people of La ilaha illallah. That's it, the people of Tawheed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he tested Adam alayhi salam. Nuh, because I don't want this to be long, there's a very, very long talk that I've done. I'm trying to summarize it for this, for this uh, tour insha'Allah ta'ala. Nuh alayhi salam was tested. He was tested like few others, Nuh alayhi salam, we know that he lived for nearly what? How many years? 950. Over 950, almost a thousand years Nuh was on this earth. How many people answered his call? A couple. A couple. A couple of people answered his call. Subhanallah. I have brothers who are in the da'wah today, right? Because I've been doing this for, for a long time now. Um, They'll, they'll call me and ask me, you know, uh, questions about, you know, getting involved in DAO organizations or etc. And then, you know, they'll get, you know, share with me their frustration, you know, that it's not really working. You know, this is, subhanAllah, Nuh alayhi salam bore the message of Tawheed to his people for nearly 1,000 years and no one listened to him. And he never gave up. Why? Because it was not his job to bring people to Islam. Just like I tell all the brothers and sisters in da'wah today, it is not our job to bring people to Islam. There is nowhere you can find for me in the Qur'an. There is nowhere you can find for me in the authentic narration of the Prophet ﷺ where Allah tells you to bring people to Islam, to give shahadas. He says, ila wa al-hasana. Call people to my way. That's it. That's all you do. You're a caller. If they accept the invitation, alhamdulillah. If they don't accept the invitation, alhamdulillah. Either way, you continue to convey the message. That's all it is. That's all our job is. Our job as, as, as Muslims, and I, I'm not saying as da'is and da'iyas because every Muslim is supposed to be a caller. It's a command of Allah in the Quran. Ud'u. It's, a, it's an order to call into His way with what you know. Everybody always asks me, what if I don't, I don't know a lot about Islam? Then convey with what you know. The Prophet used to simply say, قُلْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ تُفْلِحُونَ If you say that there is no deity but Allah, you'll be successful. A simple da'wah. Our job is simply like the, the, the postman, right? Your, your, your letter carrier, your mail deliverer, package deliverer, DHL, whatever it is you have here that's, that's most prominent. All their job is, what is, what is a DHL package deliverer's job? I don't ask a... a um, um, Rhetoric questions, by the way. If I ask, I, I want an answer, inshallah. What is a package deliverer's job? To deliver the package. To deliver the package, how? By sending it to those. By the same way they received it. The same way they received the package, in that same manner that they received it, they're supposed to deliver it. If you take a package to the post office, you expect that when the person whom you send it to gets it, it's the same as when you gave it to them. You, they're not supposed to open it, take things out, you know, stomp on it. You know, they're not supposed to do anything with it. They do a lot, unfortunately. You get packages that are all in pieces, but they're supposed to deliver it in the same way. This is da'wah. The message that Allah has given us through the Qur'an, through the authentic narrations of the Prophet ﷺ, we deliver it exactly like that. We don't mess with it, we don't tamper it, we don't take anything away from it, we don't add anything to it, we don't need to sugarcoat it, we don't... We just hand it away, hand it over. Because at the end of the day, whether or not someone accepts Islam is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Al-Hadi. He is the one who guides the hearts. We are only the one who's delivering the message. As simple as that. 
And this was Nuh السلام, He just continued to deliver his message because that was his job. But he was also human. There's a human element to him, right? He became very frustrated with the, the, the corruption and, and, and the fisk and the facade of his people. Like the whole world was just, at his time, was, was, was gone. So what did he do? He made dua against them and asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to destroy his people. And Allah answered that dua. Allah answered that dua. Every prophet, whether you uh, know it or not, every prophet was given one dua. Allah told them, there is, there, is, if, there is one dua I hand to you, that no matter what you ask me for, no matter how difficult it might seem, you ask me for it, I will give it to you. Every prophet had this dua. Nuh is going to be worried on the day of judgment about this dua. Because he's going to say, I used my dua against my people. When we are running around asking the Anbiya to help us, the first one to go to is Adam and he'll say, I disobeyed my Rabb in the garden, nafsi nafsi, I can't help you. Nuh will say, I, use, I destroyed my own people. I used that one dua that I knew Allah would give to me and I destroyed my own people. And Allah answered his dua, told him to build a boat. Whoever believes in you and enters in this boat will be saved. So this was the test of Nuh salam. He was tested. Ibrahim salam was tested. Ibrahim السلام, was tested at a very t- young age. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him, right? He was born into a family of idolaters. His father was someone who used to build idols. He was well respected for building idols that other people worshipped. Ibrahim السلام, was guided. Whom is the first person he tries to guide? His father. And it didn't go very well, did it? His father basically said, get away from me with this nonsense. And if you don't stop it, there will be, some harm will come to you. And then Ibrahim was trying to call his people, nobody listened. He thought of the idea, okay, I'm going to be very logical about this. Where there is, there is room for logic in da'wah, as long as that logic stays within the framework of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, it's, use it to your advantage, inshaAllah ta'ala. Because human beings at their base nature are logical. We are logical, that's just how we compute. So what did he do? He went and destroyed all of the idols, hung the axe on the biggest one, because he's like, okay, I'm going to make them think. You know what I mean? This is, we want, I want to give them the capacity to think for a moment. And we know the very famous story. They came in. What happened? First and foremost, they, okay, this is Ibrahim. You know what I mean? He's the only one who talks against our gods. So they went and called him and said, what did you do? They said, I don't know. He's holding the axe. Why don't you ask the big one? And he said, you know, that they, they told him, you know that these things can't speak. And he said, why would you worship that which cannot speak? Or something which cannot defend itself. So it was his logic. But it enraged his people. It enraged his people, and he was again tested. They made a huge fire. It is said that this fire was so big that, it, you know, it would, like birds were flying out of the sky that would fly over it because it would just cook them. And they, they, the, the fire was so big that no one could get close enough to put him in it, right? So they had to build a little catapult to sling him in. And as they were slinging him in, what did he do? He was just patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever is the will of Allah, qadr Allahu ma shafa'ala. Whatever Allah wills, that I, I, I accept. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the fire, be cool for Ibrahim. Be cool for him and be a comfort for him. And he landed in it, nothing happened to him. So Ibrahim was tested, right? He was put through the test. Ibrahim would then also be tested through his lineage, correct? He would be tested. With Ibrahim, there's a long story and a lot of, of, of spans in it. This is why Ibrahim is known as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him Ummah in the Quran. This is why he was known as the, the khilil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the friend of Allah. He was with his wife Sarah, was barren. He had no sons, you know, and, and, and that pained him. And that was a very important thing, especially in that time, you know, to have sons, to have people to carry on your name, etc. So his wife allowed him to take a second wife. They had a handmaid named Hajar. They said, you can have her for a wife. And she gave him who? Ismail. Ismail. And then later on, he would have Ishaq through his wife, Sarah. But then, you know, the wife became jealous. This is to show you, brother, even in the best of situations, you know, I mean, these things happen. It all, it, for brothers who think that this whole marriage situation is peachy, you haven't been married long enough. That's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. It is, I was telling a brother last night that, that, that being married is an art form. Wallahi, it's an art form. If you learn how to do it correctly, it is an art form. It's a very beautiful thing. But if you don't do it right, it comes out looking like a mess. So Ibrahim had to take his wife, Hajar, and his son, Ismail, and take them to the barren wilderness. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them to do so. We know this because when she, he left them and walked away, it pained him. He didn't even say much. He just turned and walked. You can imagine a father, you know, walking away from his wife and his child. She only asked him, 
Is this from the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And he said, yes. She said, then we will be provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So then, now immediately, Hajar is tested. She's tested. Left in the Arabian wilderness. Desert. There's nothing there. There's nobody around. There's nothing. There's no water, no nothing. She is patient with Allah and she waits and she waits and she waits. The child, her child is getting thirsty. She's running out of milk because women, if they don't drink water, they don't produce milk. So she starts looking, running back and forth, up and down. There's two hills. She's going from one side to the other, looking if I can find somebody, anybody that can help us. And then what she comes is a different ways that this narration is told. Either Ismail himself was, you know, kicking his heel to the ground, or the angel Jibreel alayhi salam was there putting his wing into the ground. But then a well sprung up, water, from the middle of nowhere, from the middle of nowhere. And may Allah bless our our our, our mother Hajr. She she contained it. She dug a well or a little container around it. The Prophet sallallahu said, had she not done so, it would have been a river that would have just conquered the world. It would have just kept on going. To this day, this. This, 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 this well of Zamzam is continued to provide so many healing benefits, etc. But she was tested. But she was patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah azza wa jal rewarded her. And then later on we know the story of Ibrahim will come back and build, uh, rebuild the Kaaba. Rebuild, I'm saying rebuild because the foundations of it were built by Adam alayhi and salam in, in, in his time. But then it was rebuilt by Ibrahim alayhi salam. Lut alayhi salam was tested, right? Lut was put amongst the people which we can relate to today, right? We can relate to the test of Lut, right? Lut was put amongst the people um, who, who, who were given to, to illicit uh, uh, indulgences. I'm, I'm trying to be as, as, as G-rated and, and not get banned from the UK, inshallah. Um, but his people were given to, to illicit indulgences, correct? Lut was tested with this. And um, he warned his people. He warned them, he warned them, he warned them. He, he tried again and again and again. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will not destroy them while there's a warner amongst them, right? Then finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to Lut and told him, it's time to go. It's time to go. I'm going to destroy these people. And I can't destroy them while you're here. Because it's a promise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made in the Quran that I will not destroy them as long as there is a warner amongst them. It's when the people stop warning each other. It's when we stop that the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes. This is why the field of da'wah is so needed. Because without it, Without people warning each other, this is when the wrath of Allah is opened to mankind. So we know that Lut salam was told to leave. And as he was leaving, his wife was tested. Because she had some affection and feeling for her people. And what did Allah tell him when he, do, when he left? When you leave, don't look back. Don't look back on these people because I am going to destroy them. His wife looked back and we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed her. So these tests have come before us. Musa alayhi salam. Musa was tested. Musa would be tested before he even understood what tests were about. He would be tested as an infant. Fir'aun would have a dream that, the, 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 that one of the children of Israel would raise up and overthrow him. This would be a dream, this would be a warning to him from Allah, right? But he took this warning from Allah and instead decided to, you know, in, 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 increase in his evil in order that all the, the, the sons of Bani Israel under a certain age would be all killed, infants, killed. So he started killing them. So Musa was tested and now his mother gets tested. His mother gets tested by being told to take your son and put him in a box. The angel comes to her and says, Jibreel comes to her and says, put your son in a box and put him in the, the Nahr Nil, the Nile River, and Allah will take care of him. How many of you have children? Raise your hand. You have children. Imagine this test. As a parent, being told to put your child in a box and put them in a very big river. I used to live in front of the, the, the Nile River in, in, in Egypt. I lived right on Sha'ri, Kunish and Nil, uh, right near Manyal in, in the Nile River. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to jump in as a grown man, and I know how to swim. To think to put a child in that box. But she put her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we know how this story goes. Musa would then go on uh, uh, to be raised in Pharaoh's house. He would be found by his wife who had belief in her heart and, 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 and uh, encouraged him to take this child in then um, Musa would then be tested again later on in life, right? He would, he would uh, kill a man on accident. You know, Musa was a very strong man. You know, that we still know the hadith about the, the angel of death coming to him. Knock his eye out, you know what I mean? Like, Musa was a, uh, was a very strong man. So he accidentally killed a man and he fled. He fled, but this was all part of the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing, this is the whole point we're going to get to at the end, inshaAllah. In this wilderness, you know, we know the story where he would come upon 
two girls who were trying to get water from a well, but they had no mahram. They had no one to really kind of, this is the importance of, 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 of having sons in that day. You needed somebody to take care of your daughters and, and your wife after you, if you died before them. So he went and made sure they got taken care of, and then he was hired by the father, etc. And at one point, you know, he would go on to get married, and he would see a bush. You know, he would see a fire off in the, in, in the distance, and he would go and be like, let me see if I can take some benefit from this, this weird fire just in the middle of nowhere. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would order him and give him the command to go back to Fir'aun. The very person he's fleeing from, the whole, the whole, his whole life he's tried to run from Fir'aun, he didn't know it. From a child to a young man, now he's being told by Allah, go back to him directly. And not only go back to him directly, but go back to him and call him to Tawheed. Call him against his ways, etc., so on and so forth. So Musa alayhi salam was tested. He was tested. And we know that how that story goes. He would end up winning that test and Fir'aun would be destroyed. Now all of this to free the children of Israel from bondage of their slavery in Egypt. Would Musa ever see the outcome of his, uh, of his work? Would he ever see the fulfillment of, of the dream uh, 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 of Bani Israel to go back to, to, to Philistine? who were Muslims at this time, by the way, were the Muslims. No, he wouldn't see it. Musa would die in that wilderness. He would die and be buried. It would be Yusha ibn Nun who would go and then finally be the one who conquer Jerusalem. He is mentioned by, 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 um, um, by, what is the word I'm looking for? Not by name in the Quran, but he is, but he is mentioned by brain, just went dead. But he's mentioned when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he, Musa sent spies when they were in the wilderness, they sent spies into Philistine to see, you know, like, what are we going to come upon when we go and try to conquer this place? And all the spies came back and said, what, they're giants, you know, like, there are giants in this land. It said, Allah says, except for two, whom he had given guidance and had given a firm heart to, these two were Yusha and Qalib, Joshua and Caleb. They said, what? Allah has made them small in our eyes, through Iman, through faith. They are small in our eyes. So, Musa was tested. The Anbiya came before us, were tested. Yusuf, alayhi salam. I don't want to go too long into his story, but we talked about this um, last Saturday at Masjid Humera in London. The test of Yusuf, alayhi salam, was long. Was long. He was first tested by his brothers, being betrayed by his own blood, thrown in a well. And then when he was saved from the well, he wasn't saved from anything. He got saved from that well. Can you imagine as, as, as a boy, Yusuf, being saved from the well, thinking that, you know, finally somebody's drugged me out of this thing, I'm safe. Only to be sold into slavery immediately. You're not like, oh, here we caught this kid, we sell him into slavery. From that being, you know, test, he, he got some reprieve when he went to the, to the house uh, of Aziz. And, and he treated him very well, treated him like a son. But then his wife, we know the story, the, the wife of Aziz tried to trick him into, into sleeping with her. He would refuse, then he would get, you know, dragged into, eventually thrown into prison to try to protect his wife's name. He would become an interpreter of dreams. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give him every, everything along the way was exactly what he needed at the time. In the, in the prison, Allah gave him the ability to interpret dreams. He interpreted two people's dreams perfectly. They came to him and said, what's going to happen to us? He said, one of you is going to become very prominent and very wealthy, and very, very known person. The other one, they're going to crucify you and the birds are going to pick from your head. Happened the same way for both of them. The man who went eventually to work for the king forgot about Yusuf. Until the king started having horrible dreams and wanted to know the, 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 the reason behind them. And then he finally remembered, that, oh, yeah, that guy who told me not to forget about him, so I forgot about him. But there's this kid in the prison, Yusuf. There's this man who is very good at interpreting dreams. He said, bring him to me. They went to go get Yusuf. Look at the test. Look at the test. For most of us, we'd have been like, that's it. We're done. We're getting out of prison. Yusuf said, nope. I am not leaving here until he clears my name. My honor is important to me. I want my name cleared. So the king, wanted, he wanted his dream. So he brought the girls who were at the, uh, uh, the handmaidens of the wife and said, we know no bad of him. Finally, he brought the wife and said, you tell me the truth under threat of death. And she said, I, I, the, he, there is nothing wrong with him. The fault was in me. So Yus was honored, restored. He became a very famous man, a very well uh, respected man in, in, in the kingdom. He ended up meeting his own two brothers. We know the story about that. They didn't know who he was. He tricked them. Uh, gave them their money back that they paid for the food, also kept them and imprisoned them, you know, just to kind of get, get his way with them. Eventually, his father would see him again and know that his dream as a child came true. But look at the path, you know, look at the path. The dream he had as a child, he had no idea, right? He knew the dream and he believed in the dream of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he had no idea what the path was going to be.
The same with Musa, no idea. When his mother put him in that box, she had no idea that the path would be all of this way to bring him back to where he was. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. We know the story, very famous Dawood with Jalut, he would be tested. Isa alayhi salam would be tested. He would be tested by being turned against. He would be the Masih, the one that the Bani Israel been waiting for so long, Al Masih, the one they say they're still waiting on. And I'm telling him, when I talk to him, it's too late. He came and gone, and you, you tried to crucify him. The very people whom he was sent to to be their Messiah. They turned against him. They plotted against him. They tried to have him killed. They tried to have him killed. The most, one of the greatest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ever walk the face of the earth. They plotted to have him killed. They were unsuccessful in their plan. But he was tested. Jesus was tested. And he was going to be submissive to that test as all the other anbiya were. We don't know whether or not this statement is true. But it's one thing I try to point out to Christians. That your Bible says... When he was given this choice, when he knew that they were going to try to crucify him, what did he do? He went to pray. He prayed to whom? If he was God, to whom did he go to pray to? If you're in help, you go to someone who can help you, right? You run to someone who's powerful than you, more. That you don't, if you are God, you don't need help. But he went and prayed and he said, what? Father, if it be, let this cup pass from me. But if not, whatever your will is, that I will submit to. Whatever your will, I will submit to it. Because this was the path of, 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 of a Muslim. A Muslim is one who is submissive. They are submitting to the will of Allah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that you plotted to kill him, but you did not do so. You didn't kill him, and you didn't crucify him. So he never went on the cross. He never was crucified. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from this. And then we're on to our messenger Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. How much was he tested? How, how much was he tested? He was tested from, from, from early on, before even becoming a prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him by making him an orphan, taking away his father, and then taking away his mother. Making him an orphan. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give him the test of being respected. Being someone who is known and liked and respected is also a test. This is a test. Just like poverty is, is, is a test, power is a test. Just like you know, people disliking you is a test for people, being well respected and liked is a test for you. It's a test for your ego. He was well liked and respected. He was known as Sadaq al -Amin. He was known as the most trustworthy and truthful person in, of his people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give him his greatest test when he was alone in the cave in Ghar al-Hira. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Angel Jibreel to him and told him, Iqara, Bismi Rabbika ladi khalaqa. Those words would change the world forever. Those words would change the world until the day of judgment. And he would be given such a test that the weight of it, the weight of it, we forget about this part of the, the seerah sometimes, the weight of it, after Allah told him the first few verses of Surah Al-Iqara, Allah just left him with this for a moment, to think about it and to ponder upon it. So long past it is said that the Prophet ﷺ became worried or frustrated, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I'm not doing something right and something's wrong. So he tried to flee, you know, he tried to flee Mecca and go out to the wilderness and clear his mind. And what happened? He said, I saw Angel Jibreel salam standing across the sky. The same one that came to him in the grave is now a huge standing across the sky telling him, go back. For indeed you are the messenger of Allah. And when he went back home, he went back home to his wife Khadija radiallahu anhu radaha. He told her what? The very famous words, Bamiluni, cover me up, wrap me up. And they wrapped him in a blanket. And in that position, the next verses were revealed. Ya ayyuhal mudathir, qum fa'andir, warabakka fa'kabbir. Now he is told what to do. He is now giving his order. Get up, oh you who is wrapped in a blanket, get up and go and warn mankind and magnify your Lord and purify your garments and remain away from the idols. So for the next... For the next uh, um, 20 plus years of his life, he would convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would first tell his family who would reject him, except for his closest. Uh, Khadija radiallahu anna wa would become the first to affirm him. And the moment she to he told her, she believed in him. And she stood by his side to the day he died. His cousin Ali radiallahu anna wa believed in him. His, his best friend Abu Bakr. Is the reason why he's known as As-Sadiq. From the moment he heard the message, he, he, he believed in it and never wavered. Not, a, not an inch, not a, not a, none of it. Never wavered. No matter what happened. Even when the Quraysh came to him 
after uh, the Isra wal Miraj and said, do you hear what your companion is saying? He's saying that he went from here to Jerusalem, to the heavens, and back in one night. What did he say? If he said it, then it's true. If he said it, then it's true. That's it. But he would be tested, his family. He would gather, he would gather his family for a dinner and tell them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and warn him. And they would laugh at him, mock him, and then turn on him. His own people would turn on him. The same people that were calling him Sadiq al Amin were now calling him a, a, a magician. They were calling him Majnoon. They were calling him a liar. They were calling him a soothsayer. They were calling him all sorts of names that you know pained him. He's a human being, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So these things are going to bother you. They are going to bother you. But his job is to continue. And he tried to use everything at his affordability. He even stood up on the, 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 the tallest hill in Mecca and said, Oh people, if I told you there was an army on the other side of this hill, would you believe me? And they said, of course we would. He said, then know that I'm telling you that there's only one God. There's only one God. La ilaha illallah. That's it. Believe in that. And they said, okay, we believe you in that, but we don't believe you in that. They turned on him. Eventually, he would lose his protection. And his uncle Abu Talib, the only person who was stopping the Quraysh from, from hounding him. Then he would also lose his comfort. In Khadija radiallahu anhu radaha. Your wives are a comfort to you if you, if you let them be. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi said this, of the best of this dunya, of the best of this world, is a righteous spouse, is a good spouse. There's no, there's no better gift than that from Allah. She was his comfort, she was his console. He lost her and Abu Talib both in, in very short span of time. And the walls of Quraysh gathered around him and plotted to take his life. He knew this, he knew they were plotting. So what did he do? He went to Taif. This is the best of creation. I want you to think about your situation and then think of now the best of creation. Are we even close to that? No. He went with his adopted son Zayd Ta'i for three days, knocking on every door and every door was slammed in his face. He sat with the leaders of, of the city of Ta'if and asked them to either accept Islam and save yourself or accept me and protect me from my own people. They rejected both and laughed him and mocked at him and then told the people to throw him out of the city. Throw him out of the city. Literally stone him out of here. The human element, all of us could have been broken by now. Our Prophet ﷺ left Ta'if broken, battered, bloodied, bruised. He stopped in an orchard outside of the city. Stopped in an orchard outside of the city to get some rest. And asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, made dua to him, what, do I, what, what should I do? What, like, what, what do I do now? What do I do now? We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel at this time. He was angered. He sent Jibreel with the angel that controls the mountains of the earth. And he told him, he said, go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And if he allows you, destroy them. I've, I've given the permission. I've said it's okay. But it's up to him. If he gives you permission, destroy those people. There was the owners of this orchard, very famously. They had a, a servant known as Adas. They sent Adas with some food and drink because there was some, a little bit of humanity in these people. And when Adas gave food and drink to the Prophet wasallam, he said, Bismillah before eating it, was a very unknown custom. But something, it rang in Adas' fitrah. That where did, you, where did you get this custom? He asked Adas, Min ayn anta ya Adas? Where are you from, young man? He said, Min Ninawa. I'm from Ninawa. He said, he smiled. He said, if you're from Ninawa, then you're from the home of my brother Yunus, who was also tested in the belly of the fish. He said, how do you know of Yunus? These people don't know. And he told him who he was, simply gave him the da'wah, very simple and sweet. The man... Adas dropped down in front of the Prophet ﷺ, started kissing his bloody feet, saying, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu annaka Rasulullah. I bear witness there was no deity but Allah and that you are his messenger. Did the Prophet ﷺ guide that man? No. Allah did. Allah is reminding our Prophet ﷺ at a very hard day that Aisha radiallahu anha wa said when she was asked, what was the worst day of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Was it the day his uncle died? Was it the day his wife dies? Was it the day of, of Ahad? Was, what was his worst day? She said it was the day of Ta'if. So when you think about your test, I want you to think about the worst day of the best of us. Life was that day. But Allah is reminding him, giving him a little reminder that this is why you are here. To guide people to me. Because not long after that, the angel Jibreel showed up with the angel of the mountains who was infuriated. He was angry, he was raging. And Jibreel said, Salamu alaykum ya Rasulullah. Allah has sent me and given you permission, if you wish, 
the angel will take al akhshabain the two mountains that surround both Mecca and Ta'if together, and he will push them together and destroy every one of your enemies. Allah is giving him a way out. Allah is telling him, you can do away with all of your enemies right now today. If that would have been you or me, we'd have killed the whole world. We, we will destroy our enemies for cutting us off in traffic. You know what I mean? Like we would be ready to chase them down five, you know, six, six hours. To, you know, you cut me off the other day. We remember what uncle so-and-so did to us seven years ago. You remember you looked at me wrong that day. Yeah, you remember. We don't, we don't, we don't live, live and let live. We don't know how to forgive each other. We would have said destroy them and you know these other people over here and you know that did these people I think that were in this place called Rome that maybe were thinking about me wrongly. You know we would have destroyed everybody. But our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Rahmatul Alameen He said no. I have not been sent to destroy people. I have been sent to guide them. He said even if even if someone from amongst their lineage you know way down the line says La ilaha illallah then what I have suffered with today was worth it. This is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the example for us. During the li lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the city of Ta'if would accept Islam. The idols in Ta'if would come down. And then for our brothers here from the subcontinent, there would be a young man named Muhammad Ibn Qasim who would take Islam to the subcontinent. He was known as al thaqafi meaning that he was from the tribes of Ta'if. He was from the tribes of Ta'if. This is the vision of the Prophet ﷺ, is that he knew what is possible, what human beings are capable of if you give them this opportunity. No, what they are capable of. So our Prophet ﷺ, the best of mankind, the best of mankind, the best of creation for us on his worst day. What about our tests? Are we tested like this? No. Very few of us are tested like this, but we complain. We complain and we complain and we complain. I'm going to tell you why we're tested now. That was the point, right? Because I think now you'll agree we're tested. All of us are tested. None of us are free from it. And if the best of creation is not free from it, then none of us deserve to be free from it. None of us. But why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us to prove our mettle, as he says in the Quran. Which one of you are truthful in deeds? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us because He is Al Alim. He is the All Knowing. He is the All Wise. And He knows the entirety of His creation from the beginning of time to the end of perpetuity. Therefore, He sees what none of us can see. He knows exactly what we need in our life and where we need it. He knows exactly the good things that are needed in our life and when they should come to us and the bad things in our life and when they should come to us, the difficulties and when they should come to us, and it's all part of the puzzle. Our lives are a puzzle. Think of, I want you to think of your life as a jigsaw puzzle. This is why I want to bring it into fruition and in completion, inshallah. I want you to think of your life as a jigsaw puzzle. Right? How many of you have done jigsaw puzzles? Raise your hand. If you got kids, you've done them. You know what I mean? Like you do, you do. <laughs> My daughter loves jigsaw puzzles. The more complex, the more she likes them because it, it means we have to take longer doing them. When you take out a jigsaw puzzle, immediately a lot of pieces make sense, right? Edges, corners make pieces. If there is a flower, it makes sense. Like, you know, parts of the images, all the, the, a lot of things, they'll, they'll just, you know, find their place. <coughs> then there are pieces of the puzzle you pick up, like a solid color. Like, where does this go? I have no idea. There's, there's, there's nowhere this goes. What do you do with that piece? Do you throw it away? What do you do with the piece, young man? You leave it for later, right? You don't chuck it and say it has no purpose. You just don't know where it goes yet. You leave it for later. These are the trials of our lives. These are the tests of our lives. These are the difficulties. They are these pieces of the puzzle that we don't know where they go yet. But we have to have tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are part of the puzzle. And they will find a place later on. Because as you build this puzzle, you'll eventually get to a spot to you'll be like, oh, we have a piece missing here, right? There's a piece missing. What is it where that piece we set to the side later on? That's exactly where it goes. These are the trials of our lives. I am telling you as someone who has been through a number of difficulties in my life. And if you haven't uh, followed me on YouTube, I'm not going to go down the whole road yet. But if you haven't, go to my YouTube and look at my domestic violence series of what I went through as a child, the torture I was put through through my stepmother, etc. The prison series tapes. 
You know why I never talked about this any throughout my da'wah. But two, a few, two months after accepting Islam, I was sentenced to five years in prison. How many people knew that? Yeah, good. A couple of you. Yeah, you watched it, yeah? I kept, why did I keep that to myself? Because I never wanted my da'wah to be based upon like, you know, some, some, some uh, uh, um, things that I had done. You know what I mean? Like, I wanted my relatability to be based upon the, the, the da'wah only. So I kept these things. I kept, they had, they had no purpose. Now later on in life when I'm realizing how much our youth are struggling, how many people are going through things, and I've been around long enough to have, have shown and proved my, my, my work for the past 17 years, I let it all out. But those of you who've listened to my story, you may have remembered when I talk about beating up a young man at a payphone. I never talk about the outcome of that in my story, right? There's repercussions behind what you do in this life. I ended up being sentenced to five years in prison for beating up that young man. It was a test two months after becoming a Muslim. Two months after accepting Islam, I walk into the courtroom thinking, you know, I've all my sins, you know, he told me all your sins are forgiven. You know what I mean? All, all, you know, everything is good now. Allah's on your side. Allah loves you. I go to prison thinking, you know, sure, I'm going to breeze right through this. And I get sentenced to five, seven years in prison. Five of them in prison and two on probation. It was a big test for me. But it ended up being the most beautiful part of my puzzle. Because what did I do for those five years? I studied my religion. Day in and day out. Every single day. From the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed, I had a book in my hand. Or uh, listening to a tape of the scholars. Or, or writing a letter to uh, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Said Adli, who was a well-known uh, jurisprudence in South Carolina, who I had gained a relationship with to ask questions about the deen. People knew me as Yusha with the books. You know what I mean? If you saw me, I probably had a book in my face and another under my arm. For five years, I studied my deen intensely, which allowed me to come out of prison and be solid on my religion. Because before that, I had nobody teaching me anything. I was trying to learn on my own. And it allowed me to catalyze, uh, catapult myself to be able to do what I've done for the past 17 years in giving da'wah. So every part of that, 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 that life that you live and that you sometimes ask Allah, why me? It's all part of a beautiful puzzle in Allah's plan. The Prophet wasallam said that nothing afflicts the Muslim of hardship or difficulty. Nothing. Nothing afflicts the Muslim from hardship or difficulty or illness or sorrow or harm or distress. Not even the pricking of a thorn, it except for them is an expiation for their sins and is a means of goodness for them. Allah puts us through difficulties for one of three reasons. And this is how we'll wrap it up insha'Allah ta'ala. We'll take a few questions. Either number one, and I talked about this at the end of my talk in uh, Masjid Humaira last week. Sometimes Allah puts us into difficulties because we've asked for it. We've asked for it. How many of you would ever ask Allah to put you in the difficulty? No. How do we ask for it then? By dua. By dua. We ask Allah for something amazing, right? We ask Allah to grant us something good. We ask Allah to grant us something that is huge, right? And therefore Allah wants to grant you that dua. But He's not going to just hand you things nilly-willy. He's not just going to give you nothing, or, uh, something for nothing. So that dua is answered at the end of a test. At the end of struggle, at the end of difficulty. What is the greatest dua that we ask for? Jannat al firdaus We want the highest ranks of paradise. How do you think you get there? How do you think you get to the highest ranks of paradise? Through difficulty, through trials. Who, who's in the highest ranks of paradise? The Anbiya. The Anbiya. The Sadiqeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people who've been tested. So if you want that then you're going to have to go through some. Or you ask Allah to grant you, you know, uh, an amazing business. You know, you, know, you know how businesses are built? I've been an entrepreneur for 17 years. They're built through hardship and difficulties and sometimes losses and failures and lessons and setbacks and over and over and over again. So Allah, sometimes Allah is testing us because we've asked for it. We ask Allah to grant us patience, right? You know how you get patience? You go through stuff. You go through stuff. I've learned that now, getting older. 43 this year, alhamdulillah. I've learned that patience comes through going through stuff. This doesn't come on its own. So sometimes we ask Allah for things that are going to cause us to have to go through some difficulty. Accept it with a smile. Because know that Allah is answering your dua. Because what you're wanting is on the other side. What you want is on the other side. If, if somebody told you, you know, that there's this boggy swamp. that You have them here in England all over the place, right? This boggy, horrible swamp. Stinking, foul smelling. But on the other side of it, it's a million pounds. How, what would you do to get over there? Bro, we'd be killing each other to get over there. We'd be drowning. People would be sinking. We'd, we'd be thinking up of every solution. We'd go through whatever hardship and difficulty to get to the other side. This is where Jannah lies. This is where our answers to our du'as lie. So we have to go through these things. 
or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the believer puts us into the difficulty to expiate us of our sins. We've done things, we've done things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be forgiven for. We've asked Him to forgive us, right? And in order to forgive us, sometimes, sometimes we've done things that, that you know, can't just be wiped away, you know, like that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us into difficulty and it erases our sins. And trust me, brothers and sisters, any difficulty that you go through in this life that is an expiation of your sins is the best thing for you. Because if you don't pay for it in this life, you answer to it on the next life in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is only one form of punishment in the akhirah. Yeah? That's the beauty of being tested and put to, to the metal in this life. Is that there are many ways Allah can expiate us for our sins through illnesses, through difficulty, through loss, through you know all of these things. In the akhirah, there's one form of punishment. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our sins. The third reason, the third reason, this is from the, the, what the ulama tell us, the third reason is that Allah wishes to elevate your ranks in the next life. Yeah? Allah knows, because He sees the eternity, right? He sees everything. He knows that your life and what you're going to do is not going to be enough to get you to the place of Jannah that you're asking for, but He wants to give it to you anyway, right? Allah knows you're asking for a higher level of paradise and He knows that your life is not, you're not going to do enough good to get there. So what does He do? He puts you into tests and trials and difficulties, thus elevating your rank in the hereafter. The Prophet wasallam, he said that a person will be brought forward on the day of judgment. Someone who was given a good life, right? Ease. The best life that any disbeliever had ever had. It, the best. Then nobody had more than this person. And Allah will ask him about his life and say, how was your life? And I say, oh, it was amazing. You know what I mean? Like, you, you gave me such grandeur. You know, like I, I lived in a life of luxury. And then he will be t dipped in Jahannam for a moment. Just taste it. Taste what's waiting for you. Just feel it for a moment. He'll be brought back. You know, say, how was your life? You know, say, my life, there was no good in it. No good in it. It was all horrible. Why? Because it's in the reality he's facing him now. al -haqqa. Then a person who struggled the most. The, the Muslim who went through the most difficulty. That no, had been tested like no other Muslim had ever been tested. Allah is going to bring them forward and say, how was your life? And they will complain and say, you know, I went through such trials and tribulations like nobody can imagine. Then Allah will allow them to experience paradise for a moment. For a moment. This is what the reward is for that. Bring them back. How was your life? Wallahi, there was no bad in it. No bad. No bad. No, no bad in it. No bad in it. And the Prophet ﷺ said that when the people who were not tested see the reward of those who were tested on the Day of Judgment, they will wish that their skin had been torn from them by combs of steel. They will wish they had to come back to this world to be tested and go through difficulties and hardships. They'll wish, they'll wish on the Day of Judgment when they see the reward of those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put to test, they will wish that they could come back. So never ever miss out on these difficulties in life. They are opportunities. They are opportunities. They are opportunities to earn immense reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we go through them. When we go through them. And none of it is bad. I'll finish with two very small things for you. I remember one time, this is just a personal story. I don't like to use personal stories too much anymore as I get older because I, I feel it, has, it messes with a little bit of the niyyah. But anyway, I remember when in my younger, when I was a little bit younger and I had a little bit more fire in me. I used to uh, wear a thobe everywhere I go, right? Like, even flying in the airports. And that. Allah has given me hikmah now, you know what I mean? To, to, to learn these things. But I wear it in the airport. This was, you know, not long after 9-11. We're talking about like, not long, uh, maybe a year after I'd been out of prison. You know what I mean? Um, so 2003, 2004, like, you know, it was, it was, you wear a thobe at the airport, you are like, you know, people are looking at you like, especially in America. But uh, me, I didn't care. Go. I was in, you know, and, but every time I did that, I would get, you know, super special security. How many of you brothers get S's on your, uh, your, your boarding passes uh, when you go to the airport, right? Yeah, a whole bunch of S's, right? Super special security. <laughs> like it, it, you're, you, you are a VIP. That is, they're going to pull you to the line. And not only are they going to pull you to the line once, they're probably going to do it again. And then before you get on the plane, they're going to do it again. You know, it's just the way it is. So I was getting pulled to the sign at, 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 at uh, security. They, pulled, they saw my boarding pass and said, oh, come on over here. You know, we got, we got a super special VIP room for you. 
and there was these uh, these rednecks, right? And I know rednecks because I was born and raised around them. You know, I was born and raised around them. These are my people. My my dad, but none of you would probably be able to understand a conversation with my dad. It's taken my wife, you know, twelve years on now, and she still has to have me interpret half of what he says. Um, they were like, "Yeah, boy, get that there, Muslim. Make sure you check him real good." I'd had enough for some reason. You know, it was one of those days. I think I was on my way from one country to another. I was being, I was, I was in Chicago transit where you have to go through security and then go through. This is probably like the fifth time I'd gone through security that day. I was, just, I just flipped out. I, 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 I shouted at them in front of everybody. I said, "There will come a day. There will come a day where you'll stand in front of the one who created you, and you would give everything that you could. You will sell your own children." to be in this line with me here right now. So be careful with what you say. I said it just like that and I walked off. You know, I was like, oh, that was, that was, that was not smart. Um, that was not wise. But it was truth, it's truth, it's hawk. The reality, one day they'll give everything, they would sell their own children to come back and go through what we went through. So never, ever, ever, ever shy away from the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is the last thing I promise. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the life of the believer is ajib. It's amazing. It's amazing. And it's strange. He said it's, there's a strange quality about the life of the believer. He said the, the strangeness is in that it is good, it is khair in its entirety. The Prophet ﷺ said the life of the believer is good in its entirety. He said if the believer is given some goodness from Allah, then the believer is thankful to Allah, right? And what does Allah say in the Quran? La in shakartum. That if you're grateful to me, I'll give you more. So through his gratefulness, Allah gives him more. And then if the believer is tested by Allah, he's put into fitan, he's put into trial, tribulation, struggles, difficulties, whatever, then the believer is what? Patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is rewarding for those who are patient. Sabrun jamila, beautiful patience. You just, you just take what Allah brings. So either way, the life of the believer is beautiful. He said, and that quality is only, only for those who believe. Only for those who believe. So brothers and sisters, never ever let yourself get too far down. I am now, I'm, I'm a therapist by, by day trade now. That's what I do. I'm a counselor and therapist by day trade. And I deal with a lot of Muslims with mental health struggles. And, and, it's, and, and there are a lot. It's a pandemic. It's an epidemic in the Muslim community. A lot of times because our Islam is not framed properly to us. The way Allah tests us and puts us into things and the way we view and the paradigm with which we see our deen is not given to us correctly. Um, and, and, it, and it causes conflict. Never hold your head down because everything is good for you. For those who do not believe, there's no goodness. There's no goodness. If only they understood. Even if Allah grants them everything in this world, it is only so that there's nothing for them on the Day of Judgment. Maybe there are some good people out there and Allah gives them their good in this life. He report, rewards them for their good because on the Day of Judgment there's nothing for them. Maybe a lightning of punishments, that's it. And if harm comes to them, it benefits them in the least. It does not give them any benefit because only on the day of judgment, it's only going to be doubled and tripled and quadrupled when they are thrown into the fire. So no, brothers and sisters, you've been given an honor, an izza, that no other human beings other than the Muslims are given. Allah chooses very few people. If you look at the, 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 the whole of humanity and how many people Allah chooses to rightly guide, it is so small. And, it, and for whatever reason, it's up to him. But for sure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote it with him in a book that is with him 50,000 years before he decided to create anything. The Prophet sallallahu said that 50,000 years before Allah decided to create anything, Allah decided to take his qadr. He told the pin. The first thing he created was what? The pin, right? Uktub, right. It's the first thing he decided to create because I want to set my will. <laughs> He told the pen, write. The pen said, what should I write? He said, write everything that will ever happen until the end, which is perpetuity. The Prophet ﷺ, after Isra wal Miraj, he came back. What did he say about that pen? He said, the pen has been lifted. The ink has become dry. And that book is with Allah. That book is what all every year Allah reveals his qadr for. That book the Torah came from. That book the Injil came from. That book the Quran came from. And somewhere in that book, Allah wrote your name. He wrote your name. And said that he would create you, who your parents would be, what you would be. And then he wrote, Muslim. He willed it for you. I used to think that I came to Islam, you know, through, through my efforts of studying the Bible. 
He wrote it. It's written. Maktub. It was written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I had done nothing 50,000 years before existence. Allah willed that you would be a Muslim. It's a favor. It's an honor. And whatever I have to go through on this path of being a Muslim is an honor. When Allah grants me goodness, it's an honor. It's a favor for him and I'm thankful for it. When Allah puts me through difficulty, it's an honor. It's an honor to go through it because I'm, I'm going to learn something from it on the other side. Even if you fail, brothers and sisters, you make mistakes, it's an honor if you learn from it. If you learn from it, if you learn from it and become wiser because of it, it is not a mistake, it is a lesson. And we all need these lessons in life. So hold your head up high, chin out, smile on your face, because you have been given something that is the most precious thing that can ever exist on the face of this planet, and it's intangible. It's guidance. It's guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why are you tested? The question is, why should you not be tested? That should be the real question. When people come and ask me, why is Allah testing me? My response is, ask yourself, why shouldn't you be tested? If you can give me five reasons why you deserve, amongst all of creation, not to be tested, and that makes the person think, wait a minute, you're right. I don't really, in, in, in the reality of things, I probably deserve more than anybody else to be tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So take it all with a grain of salt and thank Him for every single thing. Because anything from Him towards you is goodness for you if you believe. Barakallahu feekum jami'an. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.